Hi everyone, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At FilmmakerU.com, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify their existing skill set. Every week on Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, we go live with a film professional to give you a chance to ask your questions. Now today, we're joined by Eric Whip, and Eric's the colorist for Mad Max Fury Road, The Lego Movie 2, the second part, Happy Feet 1 and 2, and he's also one of the co-owners of Alter Ego Post here in Toronto. Hi, Eric. Welcome to Filmmaker U Live. Thank you. Uh, I guess to start off, we've, we've already got questions rolling in for you. Um, okay. So I guess I'll start off with Orion's question. Um, he wants to know which section of Mad Max Fury Road was the most difficult for you to color? Uh, good question. Uh, it, was, it was the day for night section. Uh, we knew going into the movie that that was going to be the most challenging because uh, the... The whole scene is was shot uh, during the daytime, and it was two to three stops overexposed, so it looked nothing like night. Uh, so that was that was a challenge, but we had a great method. Uh, the idea of it was to overexpose the footage by a couple of stops, which means you have lots of range in your shadows. Mm -hmm. Then, but you don't clip your highlights. Make sure that if someone was on set watching the scopes and making sure nothing was being clipped. Then, uh, in the grade, we were able to take that shot expose it down, it got a nice creaminess to it, but then we can go in and isolate anything we want in the shadows and lift them up and, and get all the little bits of detail in there. So you end up with a very, you know, affected kind of look, but it works really well. But to do that, it re requires a ton of robo. So it took, you know, we knew we going into it. So that was, we were like, all right, set aside a few months here and we'll work on that scene. Now, what when you were working on Fury Road, um, was there a lot of room to experiment or were, were you sort of um, tight with your deadlines and had to stay focused? We got really lucky with the deadline actually. We got almost an extra 12 months of post suddenly because the movie was originally going to be released a year earlier and mm -hmm. it got pushed by a year. Uh, I can't remember, something was going on, the World Cup soccer was on and Star Wars had moved their date and it was coming out that year or something. So all of a sudden the time frame shifted and we were given an extra 12 months, which was amazing. Um, I forgot, was the, what was the first part of your question? Did you get, did you get a lot of freedom to experiment? Oh, uh, yes, uh, we did. In fact, to a degree, yes. So the, only, the only caveat there was that George was very adamant about having a saturated, colorful looking film. Mm -hmm. you know, he, he always said that uh, uh, either we go full black and white or we go full color, but he didn't want to make yet another desaturated post-apocalyptic film like every other film has been since probably since the first Mad Max came out right so yeah. uh the idea was to come up with something just different and strikingly colorful that you're not used to seeing in a post-apocalyptic film. Wow and did any of the experiments that you did actually end up in the film? Yeah we did a lot of work uh especially the nighttime work honestly the nighttime scenes took a lot of work uh we had so many different versions we had great very realistic looking night scenes we had very steely looking scenes. We had all these, but ultimately we went with a very rich, you know, we call it like the spaghetti Western blue feel. It was like a very blue look, which George really liked. But we had, you know, some of the more realistic versions were great, but you really couldn't see anything. <laughs> and you're struggling to see in the dark. And we really, you know, it, it's, it's such a high paced action film that we can't be struggling to see anything. So we ended up uh, in a very stylized, uh, lighter kind of rich blue look. Now, um, someone named Quincy Jones, or sorry, Quincy Sloan, uh, wants to know what have you since working on Mad Max? What have you learned in HDR color uh, color grading? Is there any tricks uh, or techniques? HDR color grading is like a whole new ball game. Um, uh, and the big thing that I've really taken away from it all is that. And this is, we're in a little bit of a weird uh, phase in color correction right now, where a lot of, especially when you're working on a feature film, the priority is usually, let's get the cinema version looking mm -hmm. perfect. And that's usually the main priority. But I think we're gonna see that start to change because I think what really needs to happen is the HDR version should be done first because you really have to get that dynamic range. Uh, if you try and do it 
secondary, it's often a nightmare to try to go, oh, I didn't see that in the in the sky. And, oh, now I see that detail. Oh, now I got to fix that. And there's a lot of fixing things. Whereas I think what we should start seeing in a lot of films is that we'll we'll work on the HDR master first, which is a little unusual because you're then working essentially on a monitor instead of a cinema screen. Mm -hmm. And then and then I think you once we get that into a good spot, we then purpose the cinema versions and your home versions and other versions. So. So I think really that's the big takeaway for me is I think you've really got to get that going first. Interesting. Now I have uh, Joseph who wants to know uh, what can directors do to make your job easier and more fulfilling? Uh, well, make my job easier and more fulfilling is <laughs> stop, stop making changes after we've already finished it. Um, and bring, if you can bring you in earlier. Right? Yes, that is a, that is a big thing coming in early, getting ideas, uh, be I ideally before you shoot, because there's things that we can do that can save time or it might be easier. If, if you do certain things in camera, sometimes it makes it more difficult later on. Mm -hmm. uh, but the big thing I think is is uh, having a bit of time to experiment and, you know, it's the classic thing is it's time is, time is money and time is the biggest problem. When you're rushed and you don't have enough time, you don't get a great, uh, product. So the, just the more time and the and the freedom to experiment, I think, is is crucial. So are you saying like, because um, when I when I learned film, it was on actual film, so you had to shoot as make it look the way it was going to look as you were shooting, pretty much. Um, so are you saying like it's better to shoot it flat, and then allow? No, the colors, not or... not necessarily, and it, it it just depends on what you're trying to achieve. For certain looks, that might be a, mm -hmm. a perfect thing to do. But I, I think the big takeaway is just having the conversation about what your, what your ultimate goal is going to be mm. first. Uh, because there's some things that look so much better. If you just shoot it right in camera, then we don't have to do that much. We can just get a nice look going and then the, everything will look amazing. Yeah. When, however, sometimes when you're, gonna, when you're coming up with a very strong you know, post-process look, in those cases, you might be better off shooting things a little flatter. Don't put grads in the camera. Don't do that. You know, there are things that you might not want to do in the camera that will make it easier for post. All right. Now, this was a follow-up um, from one of the answers that you did in when from our course that we put together. Um, and it's from uh, Adolf. And he wants to know if you can mention or tell us the brand of 3D left boxes. And I guess for those, because there are some directors on here and what have you, for those who don't know what a 3D left box is, can you let us know? Sure. One of the things that uh, we do for, uh, we, I do a lot of TV commercial grading. And so for TV commercials, we, uh, we use uh, these, actually right here, we use these LG OLED monitors. And uh, in order to get a good calibration on it, you can't just use them straight out of the box. So we run behind there, there is a 3D lock box that will ensure when we probe the monitor and we scope it and, and calibrate it, that all the colors are, are, are pushed in, into the exact uh, level so that you're seeing a perfect Rec. 709 image or whatever you need to do for TV. Yeah. Uh, so these little lap boxes you sort of attach to the back. And honestly, you can use, there's so many brands out there. I think everybody, I think Blackmagic makes them, Flanders makes them. There's a whole, I think we use Flanders. Some are, some are noisier than others. That's something you want to research. Some are actually, they sound like a train's coming when you plug them in there. And if you've got it in the same room as you, that could be a problem. Uh, some, some have issues, they overheat. Some, you know, you just got to do a bit of research. I think we use the Flanders ones. They're pretty good. I, I wouldn't say they're perfect. They have some. They have to be restarted occasionally. There's still some issues with them, but uh, it's a it's a great way of getting a large format image. Because right now, when you're looking at all your pro series monitors, I think the maximum is is like a 30 inch size or 32 inch size or something. You can't get anything bigger. And everyone is watching TV commercials and TV at home on 50 or 60 inch TVs. And we want to see the grain structure the same way they see it. We want to see it in a bigger way. So we found that this technique worked really well for monitoring. Now, how much, and this is just my own question, how much do you dislike NTSC? Oh, the old, the old uh, <laughs> SD thing? Yeah. yeah, we don't want to go there anymore. That's, uh, that's you know, it's funny because I, I grew up in Australia and everything in Australia is 25 frames. Mm -hmm. And when I came... Canada, I was like, okay, so you're shooting 24, but then it's at 30 frames and you're adding these fields. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't make any sense. Oh man. 
Um, now I've got a few questions here. Nick wants to know um, when, uh, how do you go about creating a look or a LUT uh, at the beginning of a project? And also how do you go about analyzing your source footage for projects? Uh, okay, so oh, that's a hard question. I don't know how to answer that. I mean, creating a look, it depends on the story, it depends on everything, it depends what you're trying to achieve. But I generally will try, you know, I'll try uh, a gut instinct first of what I think will work and I'll save it and then I'll scrap it all again and I'll try it again in a different way. And then I'll scrap that and I'll try it again. And then I'll compare those three and see if any of them look. It's funny when you try and do the same thing three different times, you'll often, you'll often get uh, a very similar result that's slightly different. And then there's something, you'll usually find something in one of them that's like, oh, that was cool. I like that. And what, what did I do there that was better? And so that might then branch off to another look. And then you try something else from there. And so I, I, it's just a lot of experimenting, I think, at the beginning to really come up with a good, uh, a good look. Like the look development stage you know, can take some time. And sometimes you're not focused on something too. You'll find that you're creating a look and you go, that's great. And then somebody else or a director will come in and look and go, yeah, that's, that's great, but I don't like the, I don't know, the green of the grass or something. You're like, oh yeah, I wasn't really looking at that. I was just looking at, you know, the skin tone. And, and so you, sometimes you got to, you know, spend a bit of time and look around the frame and look at every item and every color and find things that might be distracting. And, um, and I can't remember the second part of the question. <laughs> well, the second part was, uh, how do you analyze your source footage from projects? I'm not really 100% sure what you what he means by analyze the source footage, but I, well, I'm wondering if he means like when the footage comes in, what do you look for uh, in terms right. of projects? Yeah, I guess, uh, again, I think it varies project by project. You know, in a TV commercial, we'll, for example, I'd scan through, uh, commercials usually 30 seconds long, so it's easy to scan through and you can quickly see if there's any red flags. Uh, so I'm often looking for that's going to be a problem or this is going to be a problem. You're just looking for problem areas or issues or oh, that shot's two stops are exposed. That's not good. Why does it look like that? Or why is this one underexposed? How am I going to fix this noise issue? Or I'll try and just do my kind of my troubleshooting first. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess in the same in a, in a feature too, you often you'll look at the entire scene first and you'll go through and go, oh, okay, I can see a consistent. Once we get into close ups, we've got a consistency here. That looks good but the wide shot is way too sunny and the close-ups are all in shade or vice versa. Or so, you know, there will be something that you know you're going to have to deal with. So it's usually just, I guess it's like the triage phase of just trying to work out what is what needs to be addressed and fixed on this scene. Mm -hmm. So you have that in the back of your head because the one of the worst mistakes I think colorists make is they will, uh, <laughs> I see this all the time, is they'll start on the wide shot and they will spend hours working on the white shot and they're grading away and oh, yeah, there's a little bit of here and they'll put a window here and they're, they're, they're doing so much work and then they move on to the next shot and they didn't look that the white shot was the only one in the sun and none of the other shots are in the sun and now nothing matches and they can't get it to match and you just spent three hours on a shot that you're probably going to have to tone down and match closer to the other shots and so don't set your look on that like you gotta sometimes uh, move around i'm i'm a big fan of setting a look very quickly i like to just kind of get a get a rough look and then move on and don't spend too much time but move on and apply that look really quickly to your mid shots and your close-ups and see how that's reacting because you'll you'll quickly find that a look might develop more in a close-up or it might fall apart in a close-up and there's no point spending all this time on one shot if it's not going to match with everything else now, uh, Dimitri, uh, first he says, thank you for doing the live chat. Uh, and he wants to know, do you recommend learning base light alongside Resolve? Or if you've already started learning Resolve, just keep with that and keep progressing there? This is more uh, honestly, look, tools, uh, they're, just, they're just gear and they're just tools. You can do the same thing on any equipment. So I, I wouldn't get hung up on the technology. If you're learning Resolve, keep going with Resolve. Resolve's a great platform. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot. There's a lot you can do in there. Uh, you know, we went uh, base light about you know, I don't know 12 years ago, and we just we liked it. And there's mm -hmm. just something about the architecture of it, and it is it, turning base light. I like because it's turning into almost more of a compositing tool. So there's a lot that you can do in it, and uh, so it, it works for our workflow and what we're trying to do and what I try to do. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean you know if we if we had to and we all had to switch to resolve tomorrow i don't think it'd be a big problem i have to relearn how to do certain things or i might not be able to handle certain things that i'm used to doing but i would find another way of doing it yeah now uh misha wants to know for uh beginners in uh, for beginning directors or beginning colorists uh, what would you recommend as, as sort of a, an essential pipeline to know or an essential thing to know uh, from the technology? From the technology. I, look, the biggest thing, and I say this too, we have uh, amazing uh, young colorists and assistants at Alter Ego who are, who are learning the trade and coming up uh, through the ranks. And the biggest thing that I always tell them is it's, it's, it's kind of like uh, flying. You need your hours in the cockpit you know you need your flight time so the biggest thing is just to get footage and and just keep working and keep practicing and you know whatever it might be just keep trying and keep you matching and keep your speed up that's the biggest thing that makes a good colorist is you you've seen enough footage that you know how to handle problems and you know how to fix something and you can do it fast because you know when you're sitting in a chair and someone's paying you know x amount of dollars per hour you can't be like well i don't know i've never seen this before you know you've got to <laughs> you've got to know the answer i mean sometimes i say that to be honest there's times for yeah. sure where i have never seen it before but you've really got to have that uh practice in place so you know when i started in the industry we were all on telecines and we were transferring film you know, for those who don't know a telecity is where you, you literally put the 35 mil film up on the thing and it live scans that picture and records it to videotape at the same time and so we would just be you know you'd line it up and press play and start scrolling through the footage and you'd be grading on the fly and, and you'd be doing dailies for example and dailies were a great training ground because you had to get through you know i got to get through a hundred thousand feet of film today and you haven't i've only got four hours and you've just got to get through it and you you know in dailies, you would see shots that one shot would be overexposed and it would be three stops under because they messed up. And then the DP went, oh, ah, I made a mistake and they would fix it. And so, but they might want to use that tape. So then you got to fix that underexposed shot and then rebalance it back down. And so you, you had to be really quick and you had to learn on the fly. And I think that's missing a little bit in today's uh, world if when you're trying to be a colorist because you don't have that training ground of of film just rolling through your eyes constantly because everything is shot digitally. Everyone's throwing a lap box, they're seeing it on a monitor, they know it's exposed, it's great, everybody just yeah. gets the footage. But then when something does go wrong and you do get a shot that's got a big flare in it, it's, everyone says, can you cut through the flare? Or you get a shot that's been underexposed because they ran out of light. How do you fix that? How, how do you solve those problems? So the best thing is just to get just get that time on the on the system and do it and do it fast set time limits for yourself how can i match you know if you've got a i use the example of commercials all the time when we're at alter ego but if you've got a 30 second commercial we'll tell our assistants like have a go at, at balancing this out and getting a look on it but set yourself 15 minutes don't spend any more time than 15 minutes you've got to if you sit there for half an hour and the first shot again you're going to get stuck in that rut so just get it done as quickly as possible and then we'll we'll evaluate and judge that and then the more you do it, the better you get at it. And it's just, it's just time. Now, Thatcher is bringing up something, I think in regards to the LG comment that we talked about earlier. Uh, and they're wondering if uh, you found issues with dimming uh, when you make small adjustments on a still frame in the LG uh, monitor. Yeah, we, we go through and uh, I'm giving away a lot of way too much uh, detail here, but yeah, we, we go through and we jailbreak our uh, our, our panels and uh, with, there is a mode that you can crack in there uh, and you can turn that dimming off. Uh, I have to admit the, the newer models, it's becoming harder and harder to turn that dimming off, but uh, but we've, we've found ways where you can disable that. Okay. And uh, Gray wants to know, uh, do you find yourself using base grade inside uh, base light or do you still do use the older do. tools? No, I do. I actually love base grade. I think it's one of, for those who don't know, uh, Baselight developed a tool a couple of years ago, I think, uh, called base grade. And it's essentially, uh, it's kind of what grading should have always have been. You know, like typically we're used to like shadows, midtones, highlights, and you've got your, your color within each one of those things. But uh, Film Light came up with something called base grade where it's more like an exposure exposure and color temperature control and then it works more like a curve 
So it's it's just intuitive. Like I'm, for example, I'm gonna I'm gonna make fun of your camera right now. I'm looking at your <laughs> camera, and there is a warmness there, right? You're it's yep. a, you're lit under tungsten light, and there's a bit of warmth and stuff. And so if I was grading that shot, I'd be like, oh, that's too warm. And with base grade, I can just pull the warmth out in one trackball, and it will literally do a color temperature change and cool you down without having to go. Where is that warmth? Is it in the mids or is it in the shadows or is not? It, mm. It's just an overall color temperature change, and then. Uh, you know, from then you've got like almost like a curve like adjustment, but you can use it on the trackballs, which is very intuitive. So if you want to roll off highlights a little bit more or lift shadows and you can control that in a, in a way that is, I guess, more logarithmic and more curved like than a typical uh, video grade style setup. So the answer to that, yes, I love base grade, but I don't use for <laughs> everything. It's, uh, it's, it's often a, a quick starting point and then I move on. Interesting. Now I'm going to have to read this one because uh, I'm not, I, I'm pretty sure I've got it, but it's a long question. So I don't want to okay. mess it up. Uh, so Putty uh, wants to know uh, Fury Road, was it graded in HDR? And when did uh, you do the HDR trim? Uh, did anything change? Uh, he says people are debating uh, the smoke flares color. Uh, is uh -huh. that... Uh, okay. Is that why we think HDR should be? So first of all, HDR wasn't a thing when we did Fury Road. It didn't right. really even, it hadn't really taken off and didn't exist. So Fury Road right. was not graded in HDR. However, in saying that, when we graded it, we had that idea that it should look like an HDR <laughs> kind of idea. <laughs> so we tried to get it as bright and as poppy as we can without losing highlight detail and without losing shadow so detail. And so... The tra I didn't do the translation. I think they just did it at Warner Brothers. Someone there did it, and they just took it, translated as best they could, and trimmed it out. But uh, there's no way that you can... Fury Road was such a complex film that it's almost impossible. You couldn't just go back to the film and start again. You'd have to just take the graded version that we did and then adjust that for, for HDR. So I don't really know the answer to that because I didn't do the HDR trim of that. I've done HDR for other things, but not for Fury Road. Now, I already know the answer to this question, but I, I'm going to ask it anyways, because that way people can hear the answer. Um, they First off, uh, Herschel says that uh, the Mad Max Fury Road was an amazing movie uh, and was wondering if you're going to be working on the follow-up that we're hearing rumors about. Uh, good question. I I hope so. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I assumed the answer would be, because it's so early right now. And, and nobody knows what's, you know, I was actually, I was slated to, I was hoping to go to Australia later this year to work on another film with George, uh, a completely different film. Uh, mm -hmm. But that is now, like, this whole COVID thing has completely put a damper on a lot of things. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> when that's happening. So we'll see. Uh, but I hope so. Um, you know, I've got a reasonably good relationship with George. I love working with him and uh, we'll see where it goes. And, and has he already shot that film or is he in the process of about to no, shoot? No, they were ready. They were ready to shoot in May. Oh, and uh, nice. yeah, Sorry and it was with uh, Tilda Swinton and Idris Elba. And I think Idris Elba got, um, he got, yeah, he, got uh, he got, uh, he contracted uh, COVID uh, right as all this was going on and they were about to start shooting. And so the whole production, everything's been since shut down. So. Now, um, so uh, Mik Mikhail says, uh, Eric mentioned, you mentioned the use that you use uh, LUT boxes for LG L uh, TVs. Could you use, uh, could those LUT boxes be, oops, I think just moved a bit, be loaded uh, to via the software video output instead? Uh, would that be a good alternative? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think that depends on your software, but the uh, the idea behind the lock box for the TV, we're getting hung up in like technical things. <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of the lock box on the TV is honestly to ensure that your video signal displayed is a hundred percent meeting the the max of. Basically, you you measure your monitor and you're trying to make sure that your monitor is hundred percent meeting true perfect mm -hmm. Rec seven nine signal. So. Uh, putting that in software, I don't know whether that, I, that would be an experiment, but that could also get dangerous. You know, you got to remember to turn that off when you do any other thing. Like, yeah. it, could, it could get very complicated, but it's possible, I guess, maybe. Here's one that's not technical for you. Uh, Michael would like to know, how do you keep consist consistency uh, over the skin tone after the look, uh, after the look and avoiding that it, uh, it blends with, uh, avoiding it blending with the background? Uh, especially when the skin back and background fall in the same color range. 
Right. Yes. Uh, that's the answer to that is slowly and carefully. <laughs> there is there is no easy answer. Often that is that's the biggest challenge. Is you, uh, you know, most films it's all about it's all about the actor. It's all about the person who is delivering the line or or in the the story at that particular shot. So it's often just drawing the audience's eye. Um, <laughs> you know, if you can get a good key, you can use that to your advantage. If you can't get a good key you have to roto it and if you if you don't maybe you don't need to maybe it naturally falls off there maybe it's the fact that the skin tone sits in the right uh place but then you're just there's something else in the frame that's distracting so you're working on that instead of the skin tone uh so i don't know there's uh, it's that's you know what it doesn't get any easier there's no like magical way like i have this magical technique where it's, <laughs> it, i have the same problems everybody else has where you're like oh especially when you see an actor against a beige wall and their skin's beige and they're wearing a beige shirt and you're like, oh, God. And then someone says to you, can we make that wall blue? And you're like, oh, you know. <laughs> there's, no, there's no easy way. It's just you've got to work on it. Well, what's been the toughest, uh, I guess, or most challenging, like, color request that you've gotten? Um, hmm. I hate these kind of questions when I have to think <laughs> and look back. Uh, I, you know, I, I find that one of the toughest things is often when people get uh, hung up on wardrobe or something like that, I, especially in commercials. We get that a lot in commercials where, you know, you'll come up with a great look and, and let's say the actor's wearing a very light shade of let's say beige just to make it even more hard you know light beige shirt or something and then the, the client will be like can we we really want that shirt to be like blue or something and you're like that that becomes really tricky or when there's a major luminance change you know, if anyone's ever tried grading that's the thing that i think a lot of um you know directors and dps and clients don't necessarily understand compared to what a colorist might understand is that but doing major luminance changes on something is not that easy when you're swinging the color slightly that's one thing you know to take something a little bit blue and make it a little bit green fine but when they say you know if they were to say uh, can you take my shirt and make it black it's like that's really hard because you're going to get little white halo edges and you're going to see if unless you get a perfect roto or perfectly that becomes really tricky so when I get those requests, it's like, oh, and then, then you see that you see someone dancing around for the entire, you know, piece and, and you're just like, I'm going to have to roto this thing and it's going to take forever and it's going to be edges showing and it's going to be, that's the hardest part. Wow. Now, um, I got to get the name here because I want to make sure everyone uh, is giving proper credit here. Uh, where did it s slipped up here? Steve wants to know, uh, what is what are your challenges from working or when working from home now with COVID stuff? Right. Uh, well, there's two things, some positives. The commute is amazing. Uh, it only takes a couple of seconds to get to work. Uh, the, uh, the challenges are that we are basically on call constantly and, and that, you know, it seemed kind of cool at the beginning where you're like, Oh, I can just do that now. I'll just run down and do it. And now it's becoming a bit of a grind where I'm finding myself here at midnight every night and working away <laughs> and it's, it's taking its time. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're pretty lucky. We, I, I moved a full base light system into the, the basement. I call this my basement light. And uh, <laughs> um, so it's, it, it, works, it works really well. Like once I've got the, the footage and the scenes onto the system, it's great. And then... You know, we do, we do live streaming out of here. I've got all that set up so we can do uh, sessions with clients who can watch what's happening live and everything. It's amazing. The, uh, I think the, the big problems is we're honestly just getting footage in. Sometimes if certain projects come in and they're huge, it's like, okay, well, that's, you know, 500 gigs of data that I've got to get into. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a long time. And it's a, you know, so you find yourself multitasking all the time i'm either on my laptop downloading footage and or working away at the same time and that's that's really the biggest challenge wow now um let's see here uh max wants to know uh, how is and i already know the answer to this because you and i've talked about this but what's the difference or what's your process sorry how does your process change when you're working on an a, a live action feature versus an animated feature 
Yeah, good question. Max, it was Mad Max. Um, <laughs> uh, that, you know, it's very, it, it's funny. It, uh, in, in, one, in one way, it's almost exactly the same. I, I always approach an animated film like it was live action. I imagine that the footage that's come from compositing and lighting is if it came from the camera. And people don't realize this, but it, it doesn't match. It's not great. There is, there's like inconsistencies because you have different artists doing different <laughs> lighting setups on different shots. So it's like having 50 DPs try and light a scene for you. It's not as easy as you think it is. Um, so there's a lot of balancing going on and, and setups. Uh, so I, I treat that very much like you would live action. You're just trying to balance something out, get a look going. The difference is, and this is where it is a good thing and a bad thing. But the difference is, is because it's animation, we usually have uh, access to mats. So, you know, if we take the case of uh, Lego, for example, if we have Emmett standing in the scene, I have a perfect cutout of Emmett. I have a mat for him that I can control and I have a mat for his his head and I have a mat for his decals and I have a mat for his hair and I have a mat for uh, his, his body sleeve color or whatever. I have every, individual controls for every element of that, which is amazing. But on the flip side of that, it's a nightmare because I do have all that control. <laughs> My stacks get bigger and bigger because we, we tend to do a lot of that final finessing. It's almost like finishing, almost like a, a finishing stage of compositing where you know compositing might just take it so far and go, we can handle the rest in color. And yes, we can. But then sometimes that makes it even more complicated in the color suite because you are now doing all these min minute controls and layering and it gets into, it, gets into some serious compositing like on, on lego we have this great system where you can control like uh flares and dirt and grime and things were all embedded into layers of the xr files and not necessarily composited into the shop so we can com we can grade it on a clean looking composite get a look going and then we can add some of these layers and blend them through and so you're doing a lot of work that you would never be doing on a live action film because you wouldn't have all those layers attached but yeah. i don't i don't have to roto <laughs> <laughs> um i just want to say this uh nicholas from uh ecuador says greetings from ecuador <laughs> hello um uh, so matthew wants to know uh what are some current series or tell uh or movies that you're watching right now that are inspiring you or that have impressed you? Uh, you know what? I, right now, the first thing that comes to mind is I'm watching um, uh, Killing Eve. Mm. And it's not like your typical, it's a, it's a network show, but it's not like a network show. It's actually a really good show, really good performances. It's very kooky. And the, I really I, I really do like the look, the cinematography and the, the grading. It's not like overly stylized in the grading, but the uh, it, but it is, you know, it, it's got a tonality and a, and a style to it. And it's actually really nice. So, uh, I don't know anything, anything. I can't think of any other shows right now. That's the first one that comes to my mind, anyway. Well, plus you're working so much right now. It's not watching know, a lot of TV. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, let's see here. Liam wants to know: uh, Can you sort of talk about how you consider characters and story when you're approaching a project, and if <laughs> it may be using Fury Road as an example? Okay. Characters and stories. When we, uh, okay, so in terms of trying to think of how to answer this better, um, I, I'm not 100% sure what what we're looking for in that answer, but I'll just sort of say that uh, we're always looking at the character as you know. Let me let me backtrack. This is a really hard question to answer. I'm not even yeah. sure where to where to go with this answer. But uh, the the big thing that I've learned over the years is that everything is really ultimately about story. So, mm -hmm. and Fury Road was a great example of that, where it's a fast-paced action film. There's a lot going on, and yet I I think maybe I did my job right, and everybody's done their job right. But you know exactly what each shot is there for, and you know exactly where to look in each shot and you're not like lost in the frame. We used to have this saying while we're working on Fury Road and no offense to anyone uh, who worked on this other film <laughs> was let's not, let's make it not like Transformers was the, was the saying because Transformers movies were 
uh, they're very hectic and they're action films as well, but you don't know where to look. It's, um, it's a, almost like a mess of metal. And uh, like you're looking over here, then you're here. And is that a good guy? Is that a bad guy? What is going on? And you just get confused. And we knew going into Fury Road, the fast pace of the editing and the, the style of the film, we have to be, you have to be laser focused and every shot should have a purpose. So, you know, if, if there's a shot of someone reaching into a table and picking up a pen, I, I need to make sure I got it. And I better not be looking at the window or, or anything else. So you need to know what that purpose of that shot is. So the same thing goes for the characters. What is each shot there for? What is the purpose of it? How do we, uh, how do we bring out their, their features and performances? Uh, on Fury Road, one of the te we, te techniques we used was uh, sharpening the eyes, and which really helps you connect mm -hmm. with the eyes. So uh, it was a little bit laborious. And, and yeah, it's funny, I say this now, but I can almost guarantee you in 10 years that there will be software well, I know there will be. There'll be there'll be software that does it automatically. But for Fury Road, I had to hand roto every single eyeball in that movie, and it took some time, but it makes the difference. And it's amazing that you know, there'll be a shot where there was someone in the background that says a line, but they're you know they're in the background, and I didn't I didn't roto their eyes. And I would play it through, and then George would be like, "Is it is his eyes sharp?" <laughs> You're like, "Damn it, you caught it." <laughs> um, so it, like it does make a difference you can connect with that character instantly when their eyes are pin sharp and you can see them and it's clear and so uh you know we did a lot of, lot of techniques like that to really just draw you into the character i don't know if that's answering the question i didn't really know how to answer so. that question but... i think it's good um now someone's a, a, a asking is there any tips for contrast management that you have uh and to make for a pleasing contrast range so that's an interesting debate because I found through the years of color grading with different styles, aesthetics of contrast changes a lot. Uh, right now, I think, and, and I guess it's sort of my personal uh, preference is I like the idea of uh, a reasonably contrasty image, but I don't like to lose too much detail where it matters. So I, I love it when the when the shadows can roll off into a nice into a nice dark area, but I don't like it when it clips and crushes. Uh, I like to see it see that grain structure or a little bit of tiny amount of detail in the very bottom end of the, of the dark areas and the same with the highlights you know there, there are times when a blown out highlight is, is needed or it has to happen you're looking into the sun or something uh but it's just finding that uh that nice roll off is the challenge but you know it, in saying that 20 years ago it was all about crushing the blacks <laughs> it was all about a whole different style of contrast that was the coolest thing to do I think today we're we're in a more of a slightly refined version of it, and uh, so managing contrast. I don't know. It's 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 different tool. I find different tools work for different things. I'll often, uh, you know, in, in base light, there's different types of grading tools, and sometimes contrast works better in one tool than what will in another. Or uh, a big thing is also the the terminology or what makes a contrasty image is not actually contrast. It's often uh, your mids are just too high or something and you lower your mids down and suddenly the picture looks more contrasty. If you haven't actually dialed a contrast knob at all or anything, you're, you're just changing the values of the, of the frame. So again, I don't know how to answer that question <laughs> other than you just see it's constantly evolving and you're looking through uh, shots all the time trying to keep that level or that crunch to the image that, is pleasing for whatever project you're working on. Now, Thatcher has a question for you, which is uh, kind of interesting. How do you manage a client uh, who's asking for something that's impossible um, or just a bad idea? And how do you guide them to a good idea or a good direction? That's a great question. Uh, and this is something that I deal with all the time, uh, especially in commercials sometimes, is uh, you, have, you will often have uh, ideas that don't match the footage. People have an idea or have a reference. And if I had a dollar for every time someone gave me the tree of life reference, I would be very rich. Uh, so I get the, you know, you know, I got these two guys in a bank against a white wall. We want it to look like the tree of life. And you're like, it doesn't look anything like the tree of life. But um, I think the challenge is don't be afraid to talk. That's the big thing that I think a lot of colorists or a lot of people learning uh, forget is that 
it's a two it's a it's a conversation and you need to have this conversation with your directors or your dps or your clients and and talk them through it and I, i've been guilty of it too going when someone says to me oh can we or whatever can we make this brighter and i'm like it's not gonna look good bright right <laughs> but i will do it and sometimes i do surprise myself be like oh, okay you know what if i do it this way it does work and the other thing to bear in mind is sometimes they will have a lot of people will have requests where they they might say it wrong but what they're looking for is actually something different than what they're saying uh so uh, you know i'll get it all the time where someone will say this shot needs more saturation can you make it more saturated and often what i'll do is actually just lower the midtones and they go oh that's great so i didn't touch saturation at all you're just trying to get more density and richness out of the image without actually making it more saturated because as a colorist you might look at the frame and go this can't handle any more saturation it's like looking at my scope it's like no this is not going to work but if you do something else uh or a tiny bit more contrast or something then all of a sudden it just it has more apparent saturation and things will come to life and so it's yeah i guess the the trick is don't be afraid to have that conversation don't be afraid to say well let's try it and ha- and then if it doesn't work don't do it and i i definitely i shouldn't really say this because this is really giving away secrets but <laughs> i've definitely been in situations before where the request has come through that i think is completely the wrong thing to do absolutely the wrong thing to do so uh i will sometimes actually do the look that go a little I'll do it almost to an extreme version of what they're asking for because I know it's all going to fall apart and look terrible. <laughs> and then then they go, "Oh, that doesn't work." No, it doesn't. <laughs> so, but if you do it subtly and in it's borderline, then they might buy it, but if you really don't want them to go there, then you know, sometimes that's a that's a technique. But uh no, but generally you're working with with the people and you're trying to come up with an idea and talk them through it. You know, the worst thing you can do is um is and I I experienced this first hand because I you know as a colorist you're always in the colorist chair working and you don't know what it's like to be in a color session with a colorist because you are the colorist right until mm-hmm. uh, I had to experience a couple of times where I've had to come in and sit in the back of the room on somebody else's session and I found it was really frustrating sometimes when I didn't know what was going on because they weren't talking and someone will say oh let's make that a little bit more blue and I'm watching the screen going okay I know it's going to go more blue in a second and then i watch the image and it goes so slowly i can barely perceive that it's gone blue and all of a sudden the shot moves off and we're rolling and we're playing it it's like did we make it blue or what's happening <laughs> you know and so it becomes really frustrating sitting in the passenger seat when you don't know what's going on so if the colorist is saying all right here's a little bit more blue what do you think here it was here it is now yeah i think that's better and you have that conversation but if you try and do it quietly and subtly behind everyone's back it's impossible Um now someone wants to know if you have uh anywhere that you go to for uh inspiration for new looks or styles. Uh no, nowhere specific. I'm always looking for, you know, I'm always looking at films and TV shows and uh great stills photographers. Often yeah, I was going to say amazing looks. Yeah, uh I love looking at some of that sort of stuff like just seeing you know it's like your typical magazine kind of shoot or something if there's a really stylized look or something you're like oh, I wonder what that would look like if we tried that in in motion right? and so yeah i don't know this i guess like everything we get inspired by life and by nature and you know sometimes it's as simple as you go outside and the light shining through the trees and you're like oh i like the way that i'm going to try and do that on the next job or something it could be something simple as that is there a type of photography that you like to do or do you like just take your camera with you everywhere Um I I don't know I like a bit of everything I like a bit of I'm I'm famous for taking really boring holiday photos of skies um because I have a sky library for sky replacement so often it's just it's literally a sky but um yeah I don't know just a bit of everything And Elliot wants to know um do you if you're brought on in early enough do you make uh lets for shows or movies or do you find that you inherit them from the D, uh the DITs uh you know what? I haven't actually really had a version where I've inherited a lot mm-hmm. actually it's always been uh, a combination of one we've already had or something uh that you know something that kind of exists has been tweaked so yeah 
Uh, I mean, I've definitely, I've definitely had lots from DPs that are that are good, but often I find that there's something about it that I know is going to cause me problems. I get this lot, and it has a nice film look and everything, but there is like, I don't know, there's like a certain color in there that's just not coming through. And I'm like, okay, so what do I do when I get to the, let's say, the green is not really existent in that lot? What do I do when I went when I get to the forest scene and there's I can't get green, <laughs> so so I'll often go. Okay, I know what you're trying to achieve with that lot. I might have one already that works, or or I'll find one and tweak it. Or now, uh, Sony asked a question where, um, and I'm going to sort of rephrase this a bit because it's a bit uh, uh, confusing the way it's written. I think is um, how do you create a look for the entire film, but then still make sure that each scene has its own unique look. Uh, in the in the film uh, in the film, given that each scene's shot differently. Yes, so you know Fury Road's a great example of that because I think overall it has uh, a unified look. Uh, but then, if we had graded the entire movie exactly the same way, it would be a very boring movie to watch because it's essentially all in the same location for two hours. And so we had to break it up. We had to find new ways of doing things. So we had you know from. Once we have this idea where it's a very gritty, saturated, uh, and when I say saturated, it, it's rich and saturated, but it's not actually it's not actually an overly saturated movie. Uh, you know, when I first started on Fury Road, I think the Dailies colorist had done some work, and then George was sitting in the edit, and he's like, "I just want more saturation out of it," and so someone had like wound the saturation knob on the dailies just to get it looking more saturated and he he's like okay that's that's better i can this is more like what i'm looking for but i came in and i looked at that and i was like oh my god this looks like a bad 1980s music video where you know the skin's all red and it's just like what is it didn't have it, you know the skies were just like purpley blue and every it, it was not a, like it's sure it's saturated but you can't just you can't just wind that saturation on so there's there's a once you come up with a look you know, that you develop, whether it be like, okay, I'm gonna go like that tinge of coolness in the shadows on everything, no matter what, or I'm gonna make sure we've got like a lot of contrast in the midtones, or I'm gonna you come up with something that is a unified kind of procedure. Then you can come up with looks per scene that make sense to that story. So we would have uh, looks where I like, had, let's have, this is after the dust storm, it should be dust everywhere, let's have a really bleached look and, and everything's really white and that's, you know, that was part of that look for that fight scene that happened after the dust storm. Uh, but then vice versa, when we get to, you know, we did, I don't know, 600 sky replacements on Fury Road, <laughs> like something like that. But when we get to the, uh, towards the end of the film, uh, when they're all out on their motorbikes on the salt flat and, uh, they're trying to decide whether they should go back to the Citadel or keep going across the software and making that decision. That was a pivotal moment in the film where we wanted the audience to feel, uh, is this a good decision or is this a bad decision? We need to be with them on that. Like, I don't know which way to go. Like going back the way we came sounds like a ludicrous idea, but maybe it's the best idea, you know, that, that idea. So what we ended up doing with that, even though it was shot like any other scene in the movie is we end up replacing all of those guys with a slightly uh, stormy yet sunny it was shot in, in sunlight but we put a stormy cloudy kind of sky behind there so you have that sense of like when you're standing out in the sun but the storm's coming but is it going to pass or is it going to be okay and it's like so subtly we're introducing you know almost like a character to the film of the weather of like this weather is telling the story as well of whether this is going to work out well or not you know and so yeah you just come up with different looks per scene but everything has its unified look. And Max wants to know, um, how does your process change when a DP or a director asks you to create a LUT? Um, what are the perimeters that, uh, that you look to tweak in your LUTs? You know what, it's funny, everyone talks about LUTs, but I don't, I don't, um, once we have like, a, 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 I, I refer to like LUTs uh, more like your overall uh, conversion almost. Like if you're shooting log C and we're gonna go to this, then this LUT will convert it all and give you a nice, nice tonality. And that is like the overall LUT. But it's not really, I don't, it's not like we create uh, the looks in the LUT. The LUT is just, it's very basic. It's not doing that much. 
I, so I think maybe the question there is more about not so much the lot, but more about the looks per scene, which is like a combination of grades and tweaks and, and other things that then I can carry over from shot to shot to shot, but I don't have to have on the entire film. Um, if you have something really strong in a lot, you're really getting handcuffed uh, to your look. You never be able to do anything else. So it's better to be able to have a, you know, essentially just have something that does a, a nice conversion for you and rolling off in the way, but then control the rest of your image through through grading and through looks. Um, now, uh, Elliot wants to know, um, uh, when you come in for, to the final color, how important are on set grading choices uh, via the CDL or are they, and maybe this is uh, part of the let discussion, uh, revisited, tweaked or removed overall per shot? Yeah, look, I know it happens more on TV shows for sure. Yeah. Uh, for the features that I've done, honestly, that doesn't happen at all. <laughs> we don't use any of that data. It's really, uh, you know, that whatever happened on set happened on set. It's a new ball game. It's a whole different look. It's a whole completely different uh, thing. We'll often refer to how things looked in the dailies. We'll mm -hmm. look at it and go, okay, there's something I liked about this shot. Let's replicate that. And then that it's not working so well here or here and, you know, and vice versa. So yeah, I haven't, uh, on all the films that I've done, we haven't had that uh, CDO kind of process mm -hmm. or, or it's been the other way, like in the, in, especially in the animated films where we get in early that we're actually developing you know, sometimes what happens in those animated films is like the lighting department will give you a really quick rough render of the scene and we'll bring it into color and we'll grade that and we'll shape it and we'll work it and we'll go, okay, this we think is looking really good. So then that becomes a reference. It goes back to lighting and then lighting then kind of lights to that look. And so by the time it comes back to me again, I start again because I think, you know, I don't want to double it up and then you're sort of coming up with a new look. So, yeah. Now, um, Aaron has a question. I'm going to connect this to one of our earlier questions, uh, which was, you know, what can a director do to make your life easier? Um, but he's wondering uh, in what way set design can impact your work. So what can, a, I would say, how does it impact your work, but also what can set designers uh, do to help make your life easier? Uh, that's a great question. You know, one thing that I learned very early on when I first started grading uh, was how important like, I don't think people realize how important production design and set design is. Like, uh, I remember I, I was doing some great TV shows and grading some of these, you know, beautifully production design shows. And then I, I this is when I first started. And then I was doing like some, somebody's, uh, like a student's short film, or I was trying to grade that for them. And, and it was, it was awful. And, and this, the, I remember the, the young DP was like, why, why does my stuff not look like a Spielberg film? Like I'm lighting it right and I'm doing it right. And it's like, but because you haven't got anything to shoot. You're shooting in a white drywall. <laughs> there is nothing here. There's no set. There's no production design, right? And then it kind of clicked to him. It's like, oh yeah. And, it, and so that's been, that is a, a huge thing. So anyway, to answer that question about production design, I think uh, one thing that I would say that is is often useful is just to be wary of, unless there's a really good reason for it, but be wary of like essentially a skin tone color. If you want your actors to really pop against a background, maybe don't shoot them all in skin tone beige colored walls. <laughs> That's going to be a big problem. Uh, or in, in saying that though, Mad Max was basically the entire thing was beige. Uh, so it's <laughs> the same problem. But uh, yeah, it's just finding. Uh, Finding, you know, if you know you want to have, you know, if it's a sci-fi film or something, then maybe put the, put everything in a cooler tone in the background and then the skin will stand out against it or vice versa. So that's really the, the big thing. But I think, you know, most production designers and set designers uh, are pretty well-versed in what's in the world. Uh, and I'm just going to make a note here for Craig, uh, if you're watching. You asked, uh, you said you were interested in Dave, Dave's question about HDR virtual sessions. I don't see that in my feed. So if you want to repost that uh, for me, I'll, I'll see if I can ask him. Uh, but in the meantime, Craig uh, wants to know, do you think that you'll be increasing these remote sessions and moving forward? Uh, do you think you're, you'll have a preference for working with clients in the room or, or separate uh, from a distance? Uh, I always would rather prefer to do it in the room with people for sure. But I mean, obviously right now, and I think possibly realistically i think it's going to be like this for a while 
uh, we're stuck this way. I mean, I've been doing uh, live streaming sessions for 10 years or so now, and we started doing it a long time ago at Alter Ego. So there is a there is an act to it. You know, often your feed will have a couple of seconds of delay before it gets to the so You don't want to be in a situation where you go, and uh, which one do you like better, this one or this one? But then it's switching two seconds later. <laughs> like you never want to be in that situation. Yeah. So you learn little tricks of how to do it. So, uh, well, my uh, fear would be more: is there monitor calibrate? You know, yeah, and know. that is that is a big thing. And uh, you know, we've we've got systems that you know. Luckily, for I'm in commercials during the day predominantly, so everything we're doing is. Uh, kind of standard Rec 709 commercial color space. So if, and most of our clients are on Macs and we sort of know that an average Mac has a certain screen that is pretty close and they're all pretty much the same. So <laughs> we've got a good guide of what they're looking at and we've sort of tweaked our methods to that, but it, it, that is a big problem. And you do get feedback sometimes where people say, oh, it looks a bit green and I'm looking at my monitor and it's not green. And so yeah. at that point I'll say, look, I, what I see is not green. I think you have to trust me here. And I'll go, okay. And that's the best you can do. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Luca wants to know, is there a particular colorist uh, or multiple colorists uh, from past or present that, whose work you admire? Uh, yes. I think uh, Jill, I can never pronounce her last name. Uh, uh, Bird did the Dawn of Witch or something. Or I can't remember how to pronounce it. But uh, she did... Um, uh, uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of the movie. The come on, can hopefully prompt me the the last the Budapest Hotel. The oh, okay. Budapest Hotel. And I love the style of those films. The look. Uh, I think she's amazing. I think she does great work. So, you know, whenever she's got something coming out, I always want to watch it and see what she's doing. Um, Orish wants to know if, if there's any career advice you'd have for a young colorist just starting out, and uh, and I would say what can they do to get into the assistant route and get into a company like yours at Alter Ego? Um, get out there and, and, and do it. Practice, 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 practice. It sounds like a, uh, uh, sound like a German music teacher. But, but what can um, they do to entice, I guess, because, you know, like if I'm fresh out of school, I'll have practiced a lot on school, but I, like, what can I do that would, um, I guess, make me more valuable to you as a company? Uh, good question. You know, what we're normally looking for when we're hiring assistants, we're looking for people that A, are really passionate about this. And, you know, I can't say how many people have come in, you know, yeah, I want to work, but I'm actually directing these movies and these short films and I want to, and I actually really want to be a director. Like we get that a lot. Uh, so if you're actually really passionate about color, uh, then stick with it and stay that course. Um, you know, do, do your own things, do your own work, uh, understand the principles of light, do some photography. You know, if you've taken crappy photos of your own and worked out how to, how to fix them, that's a good place to start because you'll know how to deal with some of these problems. Uh, and then uh, get some face-to-face -face time. Like none of us are afraid to say hi and meet you and you know, there's no, uh, you know, reach out and contact. Now, Dave's question came in about the HDR session virtually. He says, iPads don't have great luminance in HDR. Uh, has Have you tried doing an HDR session virtually? No, we haven't done any HDR work at all virtually. Um, everything we're doing right now, like we're in this sort of lockdown phase where it's all, you know, it's 100% you know, commercials or music videos or something and everything, none of it's HDR. Uh, if we were doing... I don't know the answer to that because we haven't done it yet. But if we were doing it, <laughs> if we were doing HDR, then it would really need to make sure that we are streaming to some HDR monitor of some sort, and we can get that in there. Like, uh, I'm not sure how other people are doing it because luckily the majority of our work right now is all sort of standard Rec 709, so uh, we're pretty lucky that way. Uh, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that, but that is a, I'm sure that's a problem. I'm sure a lot more people in LA doing a lot of TV shows and stuff in HDR. They probably struggling with that but you know what i i would say probably the best way of getting around that is the colors we see in this year but everybody else will get the sdr version while they're streaming so i'm gonna i have two more questions here for you because you've been more than generous with your time um actually sorry three one person just squeezed one in here <laughs> um 
But uh, Max sent us something saying that he just wanted to clarify about his question. Um, he says, what, uh, what I meant is, uh, how is, how is it that you manage to create a LUT or a reference for a show? Um, how do you manage to keep things in limit or, uh, but still have a look that people can on set can refer to? Ah, okay. So yes, sometimes, uh, yes, we have your overall LUT that isn't really, I, I don't think it's actually doing that much. It's just sort of doing more of a tonality change and, uh, but then we'll often have looks. So then at that point, well, there's a couple of different ways we can do that. One is we can create a look. It's almost like once we get a look on a scene, I can take that overall look, but turn off all of my other layers. I don't want windows and things on there. I just kind of turn all that stuff off and just leave the almost like the base look in there. And then we export that and say, okay, for this scene, this is going to be the look for that scene. Uh, you can then get more specific and go shot by shot. So this is a look for this shot. This, is, this one's underexposed, so use this light. You can go into that much detail. Or the other way you can do it is, uh, depending on what system you're using and who's doing the compositing and who's doing other things is uh, like Baselight have uh, a system where you can run Baselight on Nuke and Flame and uh, Final Cut and things. So we can actually uh, go into a lot more detail where the, the entire grade will actually carry over and run on Nuke. So the compositor can be compositing and they can literally turn the entire grading stack on in Nuke and they can see it all graded with track windows and everything and know exactly how their composites look. Like. So there's, there's multiple different ways and you have to work out on each project how feasible it is to do some of those, like doing the, the full, uh, you know, VLG file through Nuke is, is might be okay for a commercial, but for a whole movie, that's a bit of a problem. Uh, you know, for Fury Road, that system hadn't been developed yet, so we didn't have that. So what we ended up doing uh, was often, especially for the, we had a little, we actually had to come up with like a middle ground for the day for night sequences because it was very difficult for the compositors to composite anything on the footage that was three stops overexposed shot in daylight when it was not going to look like anything like that in the final because they didn't know what, if I put this mist in here, is it going to even be seen or is it all just going to be crushed away? So what we ended up having to do for that film, we, we actually kind of graded in two stages. So we ended up grading, uh, you know, I'm going to re-expose things down to where I want it and get it a bit bluer. And we sent that off uh, and they used that to kind of do their VFX on. And then it came back and then we took it further again in the grade. So we almost had it as a two stage. So there's, there's no easy one answer rule to that. It, like every situation changes and you just have to find something that's going to work for the show. Yeah. Now, uh, Adam wants to know when, when you're working with commercials, uh, a lot of clients ask for very neutral grades uh, that don't go far beyond just balancing contrast and saturation. How do you make a commercial grade more interesting and how do you convince clients to go in a more interesting direction? That's a good question. If I had, if I knew the <laughs> I, answer to that, we'd be doing really well. Uh, I think well, I it's also a tricky question because you're, you're working with, um, you know, like a brand that wants to make Sometimes, sure yes, brand. for sure. Sometimes you are definitely stuck to a guideline, you know, this is the brand colors, this is uh, his examples, and you're, there's not much you can do about it. But there is, there's, there's usually room, wiggle room in everything. And I'm always looking for how can I make it better? How can I make it a bit more interesting? Or how can we make it more filmic? Or how can we do whatever? So you just have to, you just, you just try, you suggest, you can, I, I'm a big fan. I always do a grade before the clients come in the room. I always have it, you know, I always, always have the entire commercial kind of graded before they even walk in because I want to, if they've already got a preconceived idea, which they often do, because, you know, bear in mind, everyone's been editing a commercial for a couple of weeks and they've been staring at the dailies for a couple of weeks. So they start to get used to that. And there might be a shot or a couple of shots in the dailies where everything looks a little bit overexposed, but they're kind of, they're used to that now. And that, that's what they think is normal. So when you come in and you expose it properly, they go, oh, it looks really dark. I was like, no, it's actually exposed properly. What you were looking at was overexposed. But so often it's good to have something prepared so that you can uh, show it to them. And there's other little tricks in grading, which uh, is a subtle thing, which is, again, <laughs> I don't know if I should give this one away, but uh, sometimes you don't want to show if I'll, I'll work on something and I'll have a look that I think is amazing, but I won't show that straight up. Uh, you hold it back because 
people will come in and they'll go, oh, this looks great, but oh, what if it had a little bit more, oh, like this? And then you have the one prepared that you've already, and you know you want to go there, but if you go there straight away, everybody wants to have an opinion. And if you've got nothing left to have an opinion about, you know, if not that there's ever such a thing as a perfect grade, but if you come up with something that you think is pretty darn perfect and you don't really want to change it, uh, that the people have got nothing to comment on and everyone wants to have a comment. So you got to leave some room. And we, we often do that in, in advertising. We work in, uh, you know, we'll work with the advertising agency and the editors and whatever. And then, uh, then it often gets sent off and presented to the actual client. And if it's a certain client, they know, we know that they're going to have opinions on something. So often what we'll do is we'll, we'll grade something, but we'll be like, all right, well, we don't want them to comment on the look too much, so we'll find something for them to comment on. <laughs> so you'll often like, well, there's their their product in the shot. Let's not don't window it yet, right? And we'll send that off, and they'll go, yeah, it's great. But can we get the product a little bit brighter? Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> so then you'll change that. So there's a little trick sometimes you can use to get your way a little bit. Uh, Val wants to know uh, what's the best strategy uh, to get a deep focus cinematography sort of look. Uh, it's everything sharp like in the 1940s but today with the colors like you would see in mad max say that one again <laughs> yeah i'm not sure uh what's the best strategy for getting deep focus cinematography uh everything sharp like in the 1940s uh today but with the color like you did in mad max i'm not too sure oh so wait everything's in focus you told me yeah about. uh i think I mean, uh, the, the focus thing is obviously going to be more in the lensing, but I think it comes down to the problem. I mean, you know, I'm dealing with this right now because uh, I've been doing a lot of ads that have been shot on iPhone because it's all they can send. They can't send cameras and crews out, so they send people iPhones as they film yourself. That inherently has a problem because when you shoot on an iPhone, it is infinite focus. There's no depth of field. And we get, we get into the grading room and all of a sudden it's, I don't know where to look like everything is competing for my attention because there's no depth of field. So that's where we use a lot of uh, toning and you just really want to guide your eye. You're like, what is the, what is the sole purpose? Is that person talking? Okay, let's make sure that their face is, is a little bit crisper and a little bit brighter than all the other things or, or something like that. Just find a, a technique to draw your eye. And I'll squeeze this one last in uh, Tam who bought your course from us. Uh, she says she's a big fan. And she's right now she uh they're currently an independent colorist and um after seeing your videos they realize they need to um, work on their technical uh knowledge um so they're wondering if uh do you think it would be a smart move to or a viable move to step back and go into a company as an assistant and build more experience that way in the technical side